everyone welcome back to my channel in today's video i want to talk about how i make my reptile substrate this is a question i get asked a lot and i feel like i because i'm doing it right now for a bunch of my enclosures i was like this is a good opportunity to talk about it so before we get started i ask that you please like subscribe hit the notification bell and also please consider checking us out on patreon and or becoming a channel member totally up to you which one you'd rather choose the patreon link is down below and the channel member information is down below like right on the screen so anyways let's move on from that so how do i make my reptile substrates so the reason i make them in the first place is because I originally started doing like bioactives based off of substrates that I would buy from like companies that sell bioactive materials. And I had a lot of issues with these substrates over time. I had issues with plant growth. I had issues with like me personally, I didn't like the textures and the size of things that were in them. Wood chunks or rock or charcoal. It's just a lot of things that I thought like I'd rather this be more soil based than chunk based personally. And everyone's preference is different. So I don't want to say like the substrates in general are bad. It's just not my preference. Another issue I had with the substrates is that they won't tell you what they're putting in the substrate. Like there's no list of ingredients or breakdown on the bag of substrate that you're paying like 20 bucks or 40 bucks for. So you really don't know what you're getting. Like you can look and see and break it down yourself, but you really don't know how much of it, what kind or anything like that. And I was like kind of over it. I was kind of over spending that much money on substrate and I was over my plants dying and I was over big chunks in my substrate and not as much soil. So I was like, I'm gonna make my own. I made my own substrate for all my leopard geckos last year and that was a task. It was. And I also used some purchased substrates to do that and it was really expensive and so this time when I was upgrading my crested geckos and my lychee gecko and also flipping the substrate out of a few enclosures like my Chinese cave gecko and my African fanto geckos, I was like let me make one myself. So here I am documenting that process for you. So I start out with like five ingredients, <laughs> ingredients, we're making a cake. I start out with five materials that I know we're going to go into it, I think it's five, that is organic topsoil, then also eco earth, sphagnum moss, sand, cocoa chip. What I include in the substrate mix depends on what species I'm using it for. If I want something that's going to hold a bit more humidity, I will use the sphagnum moss inside the mix. But like for my leopard geckos, which I don't require humidity for, I don't use the sphagnum moss. If I'm using it for a species that I know is like larger, I'll include more of the cocoa chip. Or if I know there's going to be multiple inches, I'll use more cocoa chip. That way there's a bit more breakdown in the substrate instead of it just being like one mass of substrate that's going to get stuck together. If you use a lot of like chunks and bits that allows like more air and more like water to fall through the soil instead of just like all being compacted into one big mess. So like if it's a big species I'll use more of the cocoa chip. If it's a species I'm worried about impaction I will specifically only use the things that are like super fine. But really those are the key elements that I include in mine. So I buy a lot of my materials from the hardware store. I'll do eco worth and like cocoa chip from my pet supply. And then I'll buy the Scott's organic topsoil and the wash play sand from Home Depot. And then sphagnum moss, sometimes I'll get it from Josh's Frog, sometimes I'll get it from Amazon. It just depends where it's available. The most strenuous part of making this substrate is sifting things. And not everyone's going to want to sift. That's okay. That's your preference. I prefer to sift through things because I want to make sure there's not any really large chunks or anything that shouldn't be in the substrate. Like for example, when I open the Scott's organic topsoil from Home Depot, and I sift through the bag, sometimes there's weird things in there. Sometimes you can find plastic or a nail. Sometimes you can find paper. Like there's sometimes weird things in there and I like to obviously sift through to make sure I'm not putting any of that in my enclosures. So what I do is I take like a plastic bin and I put a aquarium screen lid on top of it, like an old one I'm not using, and I will just manually push the substrate back and forth over and over making sure to crumble down all like the chunky bits and everything to make sure that I'm getting as much of the soil out of the mixture as possible. What I'm left with is a really fine rich soil that doesn't have any chunks in it and I separate the chunks because like if I want to use them for something else I will but most of the time I just throw them away. After I sift the substrate I also like to bake it. You can also freeze it. Freezing will take longer. Baking will take just like a few hours if you know you're baking a little bit at a time but like freezing it will take a long time because you have to wait a few weeks. So the reason that I choose to freeze or to bake it basically to sanitize it is because this is soil and a 
lot of things live in soil that I don't know that I want being passed to my animals, such as like parasites, nematodes, that sort of thing. Maybe there's eggs or something from like insects. So just something to keep in mind that you might not want to be traveling into your enclosure. So I bake the substrate, which I've talked about at length in another video up here, but I bake the substrate so that it reaches an internal temperature of like 150 or so in the actual like pan that I'm using of substrate to cook. And then I also like it to be a bit dried out, just like the top layer will dry out quite a bit. Having it cooked to this high temperature kind of ensures that if anything is alive in there, even if it's not something you can't see with your eye, you are killing it. Again, freezing is a method that works, but it takes a couple weeks of being consistently frozen for anything to die off. So keep that in mind. So I like to bake mine. It takes a long time to sift and bake. It takes like a whole day to sift a bag of soil and then to bake it. So just keep that in mind that if you need to make a lot of it, it's going to take you some time. But the good thing is you get to mix other things with this topsoil so it won't like require so much of it you know like if you put one bag of topsoil a bag of eagle worth like a quarter of a bag of sand you're starting to amass quite a bit of substrate so just keep that in mind once the topsoil is done i just you know i separate that to cool off and then i will add things to it like for example the cocoa fiber the eco earth can go right in there's no prepping you have to do with cocoa fiber now if you want to buy it as like a compressed brick and then let water soak into it you'll have to do that but again you can just add that right to the topsoil when i buy washed play sand at the store i like to sift through it just to make sure there's nothing in there that i don't want sometimes there'll be large rocks or like just large pieces of of sand that i don't want to utilize in the mix just for like impaction risk issues and I might be being over careful here but I'd rather be over careful than not careful enough I will do that with the sand and then that'll be added to the mix I don't bake the sand or anything now depending on the species I might use more sand so for leopard geckos I would use more sand or like an arid species I'd use more sand like a bearded dragon or a Euromastix for species that don't really require as much sand in their like natural soil I'll still put some because a lot of like soil does have sand content in it, but I'll just use less. Really, it's going to be up to you to decide how much you want. After the sand, I will add the cocoa chip or the sphagnum moss. And again, there's nothing to be done to those. The cocoa chip sometimes will come in like a brick and you have to like break it up. That can be annoying. But once you do that, then you can just add that in. I just do enough that there's like, a, like going to be some breakdown into the soil. Like I said earlier, just enough that like the soil won't become like super compacted, you know, because a lot of soils will have like chunks in the soil that way, you know, like water can get through, air can get through, so it doesn't get real like compact and mucky. So just keep that in mind. Some people also use bark and other things like that or like chunks of wood. It's totally up to you what you use. I use the cocoa chip. That's what I have on hand. And then I also use sphagnum moss. Again, the only thing that's required of sphagnum moss is for you to wet it and break it up. Some people just like literally break it up with their hands and put it in dry and then they add water to the whole mix and moisten it. And also how much sphagnum moss that you wanna use depends on you and also the species that you're keeping. So like, for example, I'm making my mix for African fat tail geckos and for crested geckos. So I'm gonna use a bit more sphagnum moss. And if I was making it for leopard geckos, I might not use any sphagnum moss at all. That's how I make my substrate and I like it. I use this technique for a lot of my species. Like for example, my tiger salamander who has organic topsoil and eco earth combined, I have my leopard geckos who have sand and topsoil and eco earth combined. So there's just a lot of different ways you can go about it. It's really nice once you learn about like the breakdown of materials that are in like bags of substrate that you would buy. A lot of the materials are things you can buy yourself and make a substrate and it's less expensive. It's more time consuming, but it's less expensive and you know exactly what's going in there. So it provides me some comfort. And also I really don't like large chunks in my substrate. It just, it's too much of a concern for me. So I'm, I'm happy to not have to worry about that anymore, making my own substrate. If you have your own method for mixing substrate or if you have a substrate that you buy and you love using straight away, um, like from a store, let me know down below. I probably haven't given it a try and I would like to, so let me know what you do. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you found this informational and insightful. Please like, subscribe, leave a comment, all the good stuff. And with that, I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.